good. Thank you all so much for coming today. I'm so excited to see everyone here. Um, so I actually just got back last week from the um, Digital Civic Society session of the Commission on the Task of Women. Um, so I'm going to talk about my work there, some of the things that I learned, and specifically international frameworks of law um, as they relate to women's rights and women's um, empowerment. So you're interested in this too. Alright, so the first handout you have talks about the CSW, uh, as you and my scholars have been using the letter and so full name. Um, so the theme this year was on empowering rural women, um, specifically in hunger, um, which is of course why I got to go there and um, participate in that research work. And there are lots of reasons why this is important. Um, but first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the CSW and um, how it got started and all of that. Um, so it was actually founded in 1946. Um, there were only four women at the very first um, charter hearing of the UN. And those four women pushed so hard for women's rights. And at first, they were actually just going to make it part of the um, Commission on Human Rights. These four women were like, no, we have to have our own thing. Like, we need people to hear about us and our rights. Like, it can't just be under human rights because people need certain things, right? Um, so they fought and fought. And so at the end of 1946 is when this was actually officially um, established and has been in the UN since. Um, where the Commission on Statistics and Culture is based on a human rights framework, so that's how it focuses on um, women and women's rights. So the theme this year, um, like I said, was empowering rural women in hunger. And there are lots of reasons for that. If you'll turn your hand out to the very back side, there's a chart with <laughs> statistics, and it's the very first hand that you have. Um, and it shows that rural women are responsible for um, most roles in farming, food production, um, things like that, right? So if you want to look at sustainability and the future, rural women are the great place to start with that. Um, they do, I think, 80% of the world's farming, most of them are not paid for it. Um, they don't have access to health care, schooling, things like this, even though they are absolutely critical to the food production of the world, to sustainability, and all these things that we absolutely have to look at in order to um, progress for the future, right? Um, so this whole um, session of the CSW was um, looking at them specifically, and it was really um, empowering too because the UN worked itself to bring these women to the UN. So it wasn't people from the UN talking about these women. It was these women themselves who were paid to come to the UN and share their stories and say, this is how life is like where I'm from. Here's how I farm. Here's what I don't have. Here's what you need to give me so that I can get these things. Um, so that's how they were sort of um, looking at this topic. And so how so they were engaging the women themselves to hear what they needed to have and to find out ways to get them to them. Um, one of the biggest things that they talked about is getting rural women uh, on local policy making um, councils and commissions, right? So um, even here in the US, rural women don't make up that much of the uh, leadership. So that's one of the big things is if you don't have them there shaping the table, then we don't know about what's happening, we don't know about food production systems, and all these horrible things that we're seeing happening in, in the world now happen, right? Um, so that is what I spent um, 10 days doing, um, 14 hour long days, so it's quite intense and really fun, but it's great to hear all of these amazing women come and speak and share their stories. Um, all right, so we <laughs> All right, so um, there are two main frameworks that are, that, um, the International Legal Foundation to help um, women gain access to rights and empowerment. Um, the first piece is CEDAW, um, and the second thing that you have should be red, or bright or pink, um, talks about CEDAW. Um, so CEDAW was first um, written in 1979, um, but wasn't actually ratified until 1981, and 20 countries um, implemented it that year, and then by 19 89, about 176 countries had. Um, so if you look at that sheet, um, it points out on the very first paragraph that the U.S. has not ratified CEDAW. Um, and CEDAW is the only, who, who in here has heard of CEDAW before? So, um, <laughs> so what CEDAW does is it comprehensively 
um, looks at women's rights and helps women to gain um, access to legal frameworks to uh, help them empower themselves. Um, it espouses such things as equal pay, no rape, um, education for women, health care for women, anything you can think of. It talks about it specifically through the lens of women's rights. Uh, it's the only bill internationally that looks at this, right? Um, so on the purple handout, you know, have a chart, and it shows what um, has happened for women who live in countries that do have seed off. Uh, and you can see from your uh, chart that um, equal pay laws have gone up in countries that have seed off. Um, women's right to property has increased in countries that have seed off. Um, Health care access has increased in countries that have seed off, and all these awesome great things have happened in countries that have seed off because. Even though CEDAW itself is not a law, when the country signs on the CEDAW, it, the rest of the world can look at that and say, oh, but you're not doing this and this, what's going on? You should be looking at this more, um, or something like that. So the US is the only Western nation which has not signed CEDAW. So um, I think Iran, uh, Sudan, recently South Sudan, those countries also have not signed CEDAW. So 186 countries out of 193 have signed CEDAW. international um, courts and such. So if a woman is in her own country and can't, can't be heard, and she's been attacked or raped or something, and there's no law in her country, which as you can see, um, several countries don't have those laws, then she can go through CEDAW and find a way to force her country to help her out, right? Um, but the US doesn't have that. It doesn't support countries who do have that. Um, so if the US is, um, um, financial backing and such, CEDA is really hard to um, enforce. So one of the things that's really important is to let people know that CEDA isn't this vague sort of thing. Like people hear about like, oh, well the UN and what are they really doing? They're just talking and CEDA is just this thing, but it's not this thing. It's something that really helps save women's lives. It helps women um, gain power in their countries. I mean, it's, it's real. It, 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 um, very important. So the U.S. needs to sign on to CEDAW, um, and there are important reasons for that that we'll talk about here in a second, too. But I want to move on to another bill, um, which has not come up as much, and uh, which I actually didn't even hear about until I went to the CSW. Um, it's 1325, and it's a Security Council bill. And the Security Council has a lot more power than um, much the rest of the U.N. right after that. Security Council probably is the most powerful body within the UN. I mean, they, they, they hear I mean, any conflict that happens in the world, they talk about their first, um, much all the power relations in the world come from this table. Um, so the Security Council finally, in the year 2000, thought, oh, well, women are important for security. peace-building processes. But in order to get women in, into peace-building processes in the first place, they have to have um, access to health care, schooling, they have to be in power. So this bill then does all of that too. It helps them get to places where they can be in the peace-building process. So it's an incredibly important bill. And the most important thing about this bill, um, 1325, it's not like seed off. Countries don't have to just sign on to it. And it's this thing that they signed on to, but it's not actually <laughs> law within their country, 1325 has to be passed within the countries. So it is a law. So if they pass it, they have to adhere to it, right? Um, and actually, while I was there, we uh, at the uh, um, UN last, last, or before last, um, there's a handout, it should be yellow. We celebrated because the US, even though it has a signed seat off, does have 1325. It hasn't been passed by Congress yet, but it is there. Um, the U.S. has said we want women to be empowered enough to be in the peace building process. We want them to be um, in charge of conflict um, resolution roles, and we want to help them get there. Uh, 
Um, so the U.S. has said that it's going to help unpaid work, schooling, health care, these types of things for women. Um, so we do have that, and that is enforceable because, like I said, it is a law within the country, right? Um, Despite all these great laws that we have, or treaties and such, clearly there's a lot of work to be done. Um, out of all the people who are consistently hungry in the world, women comprise 60% of those people. Keep in mind that women farm more than anyone else too, right? So they're the farmers, but they're also the most hungry too. Um, so 60% of the world's population um, is consistently hungry is women. Um, so anti-partner um, violence is still a big issue. Um, so Japan has the lowest rate of 15%, which is actually very low. And then um, ruin Ethiopia have the highest, um, 7% of women. Um, so this is still obviously a problem. Um, and so 16% of the world's population not read or write. Two-thirds of those are, of course, women. Um, and so, despite these bills and laws, there's still a lot of work to be done. And this is why these have to be talked about. This is why people have to know that they are out there, that, they, um, that there is a framework which women can look to to help them. Um, and the important thing about this is that we're not trying to tell women what they need. We're trying to let women see what they have so that they themselves can get what they know they need. Because women know, you know, what like what their lived um, experience is more than we can tell them. You, know, you, you know how you live your life and you know what you need. And so the importance is to make sure women know that these frameworks are there so they know how to get to them, so that they know how to use them. Um, so that these sorts of things um, can improve. Um, importantly, though, we want to bring this up. Um, because this isn't something that's out there in the world, it's here too. Um, so, the US has a food insecurity rate of about 15%. Um, Tennessee's is a little bit higher, it's about 17%. Um, the East Latin Tennessee is the highest, right? And so, most of the people who are food insecure are single mothers. 35.5%. 1% of those who are consistently hungry are women with children. And that's a lot of people here in the US, right? So this isn't something my like, you know, tells poor people somewhere else in the world. That's not how it works. It's all of us that are facing the same issues. Um, one in four will be attacked by their partner here in the US. Um, the majority of people here can read and write, but um, the caveat to that is 2.6 million rural children cannot read. And 23% of people who live in rural um, places can only read on second or third grade um, reading level. Right? So there, there's still a lot of work to be done, specifically here and in East Tennessee and in places like this um, area. So it's important to look at this. And then on top of that, we have to next slide. Um, recently, I'm sure you all have seen and heard the insane laws and bills that are being passed left and right here in the U.S. Um, completely bent on trying to control women's rights and access to health care. I mean, we can name 20 or 30 bills that have just been heard probably this month about this issue. Um, so that's one of the things that we have to consider. So the U.S. has a sign see off. So then things like this can happen and the rest of the world can't say anything, right? Because there's no framework and be like, all right, US, come on, get, get, get this all together and get your stuff. Because there's not a framework, we haven't signed it. It's not um, part of our system. And so then women who are um, affected by these things then can't go outside of the country to work with them because we haven't signed seat off. Right? So it's really important to realize that these um, international frameworks are not really these vague things floating out in space. They're very important, and they're, in, and, and they're very important to us here, I mean, right now. Not sort of like, well, we'll help the poor people here and here, but no, this is about us. What's happening now? Um, so, okay. Um, 
so strategies for change. Um, so one of the things that we talked about is that for all women, there's not very many of them in this department or the places that um, the economic or political system would see as power, right? So women have to use strategies instead. Um, for instance, I met a woman, um, Margaret Rickson Williams, who is uh, was the first woman parliamentarian of Namibia, and um, they were hearing a law about rape. So there was no law on rape, and she was the only female in all of Parliament. And you know, so the men kept saying, "Well, it's how the women dress. You know, how how they look, how they dress." So she was like, "Well, no one's going to listen to the women because I'm the only one here." So she comes to Congress wearing a see-through robe. And she waits her turn silently. And they get to her and she stands up and steps out in her completely see-through robe. And she says, you don't want to pass this bill. And I challenge you, rape me. Look at me. I'm obviously asking for it. And so she does this in Congress. And all of the men stop. And they're just horrified. Like, oh my goodness, what is this woman doing? Like, we're not going to rape you. That's crazy. And she's like, oh, so you have the choice of whether you're going to rape me or not. And so, then they pass the bill. It, was, it took that, right? So we have to think in those ways. Like, <coughs> what can we do with the few voices that we do have to have them heard? Um, so I'm glad I thought how to start the conversation. Um, so obviously, we talk about how important um, international firms and law are for um, women. Uh, but I want to hear what some of you think. Some of the thoughts that you have to add to that, like why they're important, or other ways that we. Looking at these two. What's the question, Piper? Um, ways in which you think that international frameworks of law are important or not for women. Oh, what's the what's the reasoning um, that you have seen for the U.S. not uh, signing off on CEDAW? Yeah, sometimes in the U.S. the rationale is, well, we, that we don't want to you know, give the international organizations um, priority, you know, over national uh, laws, federal laws, or these that take detract from the power of the U.S. to control, you know, it, it, its own uh, destiny, so to speak. So, what are the contributions that you have heard about why? The U.S. has been signed off on CEDAW. It has one of the like, big ones. Um, and of course, to the U.S., if it's signed off, then it has to attempt to adhere to it, and that would mean um, asking the uh, ERA, for instance, right, to be unequal rights amendment. We would have to pass that, and then it would be from the Constitution, so something that CEDAW says, we would have to be constitutionally guaranteed rights. Um, well, we can always say the 14th Amendment. You know, I'm not going to need to pass the R.A. You could always fall back on the 14th Amendment. But there's some of the similar, similar kinds of reasonings. Well, we don't want to, you know, give our good power away. Yeah, I mean, things like that. Um, and then, too, I mean, just, um, I think on the back of that red sheet, there's a list of things, um, facts. But, too, I'm um, the current comment on Family planning and access to health care, that has been a huge one. I mean, the U.S. does not want to touch that. Um, it's in CEDAW, and they're horrified what that may mean and what they may have to do um, to prevent these laws that are being heard in the U.S. now and things like that. And that's a really big one, is access to health care um, for women. And so, so the basic human rights um, aspect of it, I think what the U.S. doesn't really like so much because um, we would have to change a whole lot of things and enforce things too. Um, health care as a right, for instance. Like that's just things well, that in the larger context, it's just a case of another case of American exceptionalism. We don't think that we need to be washed. We're always good. The laws are for the bad kids. Two 
follow up on what Teresa was saying, we would be we would be recognizing our own accountability and, and making a public statement that that we are accountable and that um, there are there are flaws in our system that we need to address. We would so we would be you know, waving our flag that that um, that we need to address those things.
take one of the two of the tables at the bank and you shape it. Um, and then all of us too, of course. I mean, I want to turn and shape the table. And that's something important to think about. Um, student groups and activities. Um, I know Shane is a um, model you in. Right. Um, so we do have students here that do amazing work on um, this majority leadership um, alliance on campus. Um, and the LCRC does a lot of really great work with human rights and women's rights. Um, so there are people and places that are here on campus that do this work. So finding them and tapping into that I think is incredibly important because they, they are here and they need to be seen far more than they are now. Um, and then that women's studies, of course, does is um, we teach this in the uh, coursework that we offer. Uh, and I think it would be great to see more and more of that coursework offered. Um, it's especially important to, if we seriously want to consider human rights uh, a sustainable future, these things are absolutely critical. It's not a side course, it's not something that's just like, oh, I'm going to take this really cool course because it sounds fun. It's absolutely essential for human rights in the future. I mean, that just is how it is. Um, encourage users to get involved in things, forcing them out of the classroom, um, forcing them to work with other people, forcing them to share their stories and hear stories. Um, that's really important. I know in the majority of our women's studies courses, um, students don't do some sort of project where they work with um, people on campus or here in the community. And I mean, that, that has really shaped the work that I've done. That's why I went on to do what uh, the things I've done um, is because of that. So when, when you start to work with people and hear their stories, you start realizing that, oh, this isn't this one thing that just affects me or this one person I know. This is, this is um, shaping how a lot of people live. And so there's something more to this. So how can I go on and find out what else is happening? What's making this certain happen? Like um, hunger, for instance, that's what I do. And that started here um, when I did a project in my junior year of undergrad. I'm with Second Harvest. Um, I think I was in Women of a Little Perspective, possibly. And we had to go do something, and that's what I did. And seeing that, I really, I was like, so hunger is this really big thing that affects a lot of people. And so why are people hungry? Where does this come from? Don't we have the food? Like what, what's happening? Um, so that's an, um, extremely important. And then, of course, one of the most important things that we can do is remember to pull people up as we climb. Um, so you can't just shave a table on your own and then you have to be done with it. Teach the people behind you. You have to be sure that they know what you know. Because you know, if you're gone, then, then it's all gone. And, um, um, especially here, where people come here and then want to leave. This wants to say in East Tennessee, you know, it's how people feel. Um, so people come here and they leave and don't pass on what they've learned, what they've done, all these amazing things that people here have been doing for a very long time. And those are sort of lost and filtered out and not heard of again. So then people here don't feel like they've um, ever done anything because they don't see it, they don't hear about it because people aren't coming back and saying, look, you can do this too. And I know it because I did it and I've been here too. Um, so that's one of the most important things is to not forget that it's not just um, us. It's not just me or I. It has to be all of us and we have to work together. And um, one of the big things that we talk about a lot is there's um, sort of atmosphere of competition with women. I'm sure some of you may have noticed that, possibly. Um, where women like to sort of look at each other and be like, oh, but look at her, she's not this, or oh, I'm so much better, like, you know what? And that's one of the things that hurts women. Like, even if someone, you know, is wearing a funny dress, it's okay. You know, like, so to get past that sort of tackiness, I don't really like that term, but, but I mean, it's something that does happen, and we have to see that. And sure, I mean, we can say things, but it's important to know that we're all in this together, right? So we all have to fight. And even if you lose people behind, like, where are you really going to go? I mean, your answer is not going to happen. Um, so those are my girls. And I want to go ahead and um, open it up to see what other things people are doing. I want people here to share the great work that they've done and other ideas for how um, ETFC can um, get students and East Tennessee, um, even the U.S., to become more involved in international frameworks um, to help empower women, especially rural women, who 
work so hard to bring us food and sustainability and everything else that we just just see in our databases. So Well, you, you've done some work on uh, you know, some others who have worked on some projects in this area. Um, and, you know, really, they're, they're, I wouldn't diminish, this is my own thought, uh, I wouldn't diminish East Tennessee as a place to live. You know, um, it's a lot of us have been there a number of years and we're not from East Tennessee. So it's, it's a good area to live. Thing. Um, that aside, um, I know you have worked with some local uh, food organizations about the year. So I don't know if you say some things uh, you know, about what you've done or, or what you know about some others have done. Uh, Stephanie has some work and you have talked about what you've done. Yeah, sure. Um, so starting last spring, um, this is part of my thesis project. Women who live here um, and specifically women who work with food or farming or sustainability of food. And um, some of the ones that were um, Sam Jones of the uh, Carver Rec Center. She um, established the Carver Peace Garden a few years ago. And she does amazing work there. Um, people who live in my area come and have um, small pots, but it helps them. And then she um, also helps teach people how to can. I guess I was just going to say a few words about the, the World Mali United Nations, um, which I got back from as last week. So um, a lot of what you're talking about is really interesting because 
the, the World Model United Nations is like a, if you're not familiar with the program, it's in a lot of high schools and colleges as well. Um, and we've just established it this last semester here for the first time on ETSU's campus. Um, and the, it's, it's a mock, it's a simulation of what people do at the UN and their specific committees. So I, I got really lucky this year being on the World Conference on Women. And it's, it's a really, it, it really got my interest. Um, Dr. Crumley actually brought it up to me, the whole program and the convention and the conference. So it's, it's cool because in the U.S. when they do Model United Nations, it is people coming mostly domestically. So it's people from the U.S. representing certain countries, well, representing, try, trying to come from a perspective of different nations. Um, but everyone that's actually speaking in discussion are U.S. Um, citizens usually. And so the world of Mali United Nations was created with the intention of hearing local perspectives. So the people in my committee were actually from different nations all over the world. And it was really cool because we were talking about the status of the girl child and, um, and representation of women in parliament. And so it was really eye-opening to hear people discuss from their own nation's um, perspective. And, um, and it was also what, what you're saying here about we want to shape the table. Um, in our committee, we had probably five men um, and like 20 women. And the, the issue was even our chair brought up why are the men continually coming up here more than the women? And so it's interesting that you're, you're right, like the women were there, but so many of them were, were silent. Um, and so that was an interesting thing to see that it continually was being um, led primarily by the men. And the other thing is, that I was gonna ask you along that, those lines is when we were kind of discussing, because in committee what you do is try to develop a resolution and then, um, what, what, you, what you would want to implement if you were in, in positions that you could implement programs or changes. And, um, and a lot of what I was hearing, because I was, I was trying to listen to how people discuss what they think would create positive change when they don't come from the experience of the people that they're talking about. And it was really bothering me because I kept hearing, well, they just don't know, or they, if they only could do this, or if we only told them this or taught them this, then they would be able to do this. And it was bothering me so much because these were people all in university setting, in higher education, um, from very specific backgrounds, economically for the most part, because um, a lot of them had paid or had families pay for them to go to the conference. And so it was it's hard for me to feel comfortable in the discussion because I, I really, what, what you're saying about having people, having the voices at the table that, that aren't, that represent different situations and different experiences and things like that. And so I was wondering if, when you went to your visit, I don't know what all you got to do, but if you noticed or heard of people bringing in you're talking about rural rural women, so I don't know if there's people from rural community being brought in or if that's a push in the UN to have um, more voices heard from different experiences because that's also been a big um, kind of a negative a negative um, argument against the UN a lot of times is, and Lama Gabawi, um, I read in her book, if you all haven't read it, it's really cool, Mighty Be Our Powers, and she talks about how the UN came in and basically said, um, okay, we see what's going on with this conflict here in a certain situation, and this is what we're gonna do. And she talks about how she went to them and said, wait, you haven't heard our voices, you haven't asked the community's opinion, how do you know how this will affect our community? How do you know that it will be a positive change? And, um, and she said that she was turned away repetitively and so they went ahead and implemented what they wanted and it created a, it created a big um, problem with their trying to dis disarm and take away weapons and it created a bigger issue following that because their voices weren't heard in the community. It wasn't community motivated as a joint movement. And so um, that's what I was wondering, that was my big concern. I was wondering what your perspective or if you learned anything on that while you were at your conference. Work on that. Um, they pay for 
Brunei to Amber, several hundred women um, to come to the UN to talk and share their stories. Um, so that was a really great thing to see that they had worked so hard to do that. Um, but at the same time, one of the things we talked about was how civil society was um, there. They're the ones who actually went in and picked the women, right? So the women had to be found and then they were chosen. Um, so even then, it was still like, who, who did you pick? Where is women actually coming from? Um, but then to, to still, the, 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 they were there, it was still incredibly hopeful. And, um, but yeah, there still was a very um, imperialistic feel sometimes. And um, a lot of the time, um, a woman would choose to speak in her um, indigenous tongue. Right? And no one would be there to help her to translate. And so that, when you, when you have to translate yourself sometimes, that sort of silences your place. And that was the big thing too. Um, so we, um, and then even when people would be in their own tongues, other people from the U.S. would just sort of not there. So they're like, you know, I'm not going to try to because this is too hard. This is, this takes too much time. And they would just whenever that you went to your UN conference mm -hmm. and I'm just looking for an insight here like if there was discussion that went on after the fact let's just say for the sake of argument that the presidential administration changes with the next you can write all of these action plans that you want to an administration that comes in and opposes or doesn't care not so much opposes, but doesn't care. Did you all discuss, like, if the administration changes, what happens to this? Because it's going to go down the teams. I mean, for sure. And that's one of the things we tried to discuss, but um, it was really hard to get that through because no one wants... The, the thing about a lot of um, top-level um, officials is that that's, this is just to make them look good, right? And so... Um, Will, who I was with, really hammered them on that. And we actually presented to them um, a 64-page list of things we thought they should do to make this um, more um, enforceable, I guess. And I have that if you want to see it. I mean, it's pretty intense by looking at these things need to actually be passed through the Congress. This needs to be in the Constitution. Like, these are things that people need to be doing. Like, you can't just stand up here and say this. Um, so that was, that, that was one of the, I think, the best things about being there was to hear the women call them out. Like, well, what do you actually mean? What do you, like, tell me the things you have done. I don't want to hear these words anymore. I want to know what you have done. You know, so that was really good, was to see that, so. Okay, so there was. Yeah. 